right, my guest today on the Shot Clock Scribbles, episode number 20. My guest today is a host, an analyst from NBC Sports California. If you live in California, you've seen his face quite a lot. Also, he's on the Kings radio broadcast. He's a play-by-play -play for the Stockton Kings down in the 209. Plus, he is on the Deuce and Mo podcast. Sacramento's own Deuce Mason. Deuce, thanks so much for joining me today. Appreciate you having me. Yes, I appreciate you jumping on the show. It means a lot to me as a Sacramento local here. I wanted to talk about basketball or your career. Yeah. Awesome. To start off, could you tell us about a, a little bit about your career? What got you in into the media space and how you got to be covering your beloved Sacramento King? Yeah, it's, it's a wild journey to think about and it's still ongoing, but I, I knew at a pretty young age I wanted wanted to be in some form of media. I think when I was really, really young, I'm talking like five, six, seven years old, I was like, I want to be on TV. I want to be on yeah. the news. And I was obsessed. Like, I remember going to the state fair with my grandma and be looking for the local news station and they're like set up just to talk to the anchors. And then I, there, there's a show called Good Day Sacramento that I actually eventually worked on, which is kind of cool, but I was obsessed with watching that show. And I used to look up phone numbers in the phone book back in the day and call in trying to talk to like TV personalities. I was just, oh, wow. I was always obsessed. Like yeah. I, there was just something about it. And as I got in my early teens, the, the Kings really started to blossom into one of the best stories in the NBA. I was just captured by it. Like for me, sports was always a distraction in life. The kind of chaotic childhood. My dad was in and out of prison most of my life. The home life was a little wild. Basketball, sports always was an escape for me. Mm -hmm. Paying attention to transactions and learning the league and learning the history of the game. I just was like, I want to be a part of it. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but it, eventually I started writing for the school newspaper in high school. And then I was trying to get internships at local sports stations or radio stations. Eventually I got this like, I guess you called an internship at uh, Sports 1140 when I was 16 years old. And I was just a phone screen. I just sat there and kind of, all right, let's just uh, learn. I'll be quiet. I just want to be, I want to learn and soak this in. And that's kind of how my journey started. I just, I, w I feel lucky that I knew at a young age, I knew what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I was like willing to like just obsess about it. And that's kind of where I am now is like just grinded to to get here and it's the grind continues yeah no that's a fascinating story i would say not a lot of people know what they want to be when they grow up right it's still kind of like oh, maybe i want to do this maybe i want to do that but it sounds like you were pretty dialed in and you knew you knew what you wanted to do and i feel very i don't know why that was you know i know so many people to this day don't know and that's okay too mm -hmm. like you i don't know 10 years from now i may have an epiphany and go you know what i want to try something different but like i can't yeah. picture it but yeah yeah, I, I, I just knew I wanted to be involved in this. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. And speaking about your internship, can you talk to us about recording yourself as a play-by-play -play as you watch the games? I, I... Yeah, I mean, even before my internship, I used to, you know, again, I was obsessed. So, you know, in my head, I would be like, I want to be doing sports radio and I want to be doing play-by-play. -play. So I would be in my bedroom or some room where I could find some quiet. I turn on a game and I had a little tape recorder. I would record myself calling the game uh, and I record myself doing mock talk shows, yeah, you know, yeah, like I was doing a sports awesome. radio show, you know, it, I didn't know what I was doing per se, but it was like, I was listening to so much sports radio and watching sports on television, all the TV shows. Mm -hmm. and my thought was like, Ooh, I want to, I want to try this. Ooh, what about this? And mm -hmm. it's crazy how your style evolves as you mature and what you learn, what's good, what's bad. And that's just the evolution is always going to be important in this business and uh, always stay evolving. But yeah, that was kind of my early time is like I would mute the TV and I'd be calling the action. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. Those tapes, I don't even know where they are, to be honest. They're gone, but it'd be funny to listen back to some of that. Was it literally like a cassette? Yeah, it was a little, like, yeah, a little, yeah, exactly. You're making me feel old now. Yeah, this was like early 2000s. Yeah, so like I probably see. like 2003, 2000, yeah, 2004, 2005. I'm recording on a little tape. Wow, that's, that's awesome. That's a awesome. yeah. yeah, that would be one for the memorabilia for sure. Yeah. And, and, and also while you're growing up, Deuce, was there a certain broadcaster that 
you wanted to be like, or you were just like, hey, like I'm kind of amazed by this podcast. Yeah, want to be like them. You know, it's so tough. I mean, there's just so many good ones. You know, oh, yeah, I, oh, I yeah. think you think about the big games and stuff. I've always had a love for Kevin Harlan because of his versatility. One, but I, I think the biggest thing with him is his passion. I think there are so many times, and we're guilty of it as fans, people in the media. You know, you become jaded sometimes. This is a kid's game. We gotta watch basketball or football, whatever. It's a kid's game. It's yeah. fun. It's yeah. supposed to be fun. For sure. And I know it gets clouded because there's a lot of money involved and contracts, all this stuff, right? But if you really go down, it's just a game. And I appreciate how Kevin Harlan enjoys these incredible athletes doing some improbable things. We see it all the time now, and you you just get accustomed to it. It's like, oh, LeBron James, oh, what a play. He's, you know, 40 years old. It's like, no, 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 no. LeBron James is doing something that no 40-year-old has ever done. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Incredible. And so I think what Kevin Harlan does is he makes every game feel important, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, not he doesn't fake it. You know, it's, it's genuine there. These, these athletes do incredible things on the court every single night. And I appreciate his passion and joy that he puts out there every time he calls the game. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Kevin Harlan is definitely one of my favorite as well. It was a pretty good moment that he had covering the Indiana Pacers game. I think he got recognized for his time there and he got a jersey too for his time there as he used to call the indiana indiana pacers games too oh so it's, no that was yeah minnesota it was actually the minnesota timberwolves he oh, used to he yes. it was his first yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i know exactly what you're talking about though thank you but yeah thank you and, and so we got honored for that yeah he's just it's fun you know mm -hmm. and there are other now there i'm fans of so many of them now because you know I, i'm in it and i'm like oh i love what this guy does i love what this person does mm -hmm. oh she does this great so mm -hmm. really cool to see, but hard doing it at a high level for years, yeah. you know, and I don't know. I just, I also, in those moments where it's tense, he does such a good job of like, when it's so back and forth, he's calling a lot of it. And mm -hmm. a lot of people nowadays don't love where play by play calls a lot of the action, mm -hmm. let the picture do mm -hmm. the work and get mm -hmm. your analyst involved. I'm all about that. But Kevin Harlan, I mean, he's getting amped up. I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm getting up like, oh my goodness, this mm -hmm. is a big moment. Or are we all paying attention? Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just love that about him. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Kevin Harlan's definitely, definitely a legend, a hundred percent. And, and speaking on this broadcasting as well, dude, this, you've been in this me media space for a while, 15 years and counting now. Are there certain key moments in your career or milestones that, you know, that got you into this journey. Well, yeah, sports, there's sports broadcasting. There's there's definitely moments. It's so when you're just doing it every day, I don't always go back and reflect on like this moment. And it is important to reflect. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting you ask that question when you triggers a lot of different things. You I think for me, there there have definitely been highs, but I think the lows can stick with me because it led to something better down the yeah. road. It don't always have to be a, a bad thing. I, I think I was early in my career. I was working in Sacramento full time behind the scenes at a radio station as a producer board op. And uh, I got the opportunity to go be a producer of a sports morning show at a brand new station in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I had one semester left at SX. I was able to finish my degree while being in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. This is a big opportunity, a new station producing a morning show. I'm 22, 23 years old. And it was a very overwhelming thing. And I had thoughts about leaving the business. I thought, oh, maybe I should just go be a teacher. This is maybe I'm not made for this. I always had dreams of being on air. And I felt like maybe I was being pigeonholed into a producer, which there's nothing wrong with being a producer. I just wanted more. Yeah. And I don't know. I just, you know, it was my first time moving from Sacramento. I was living in a new city. It was a little overwhelming. So I quit yeah. after a year without having anything lined up. Eventually got back behind the scenes at KHDK. And worked my way up and became a talk show host again there. But the point being is like, there are pivotal moments like that. I learned a lot of lessons from my time in San Francisco, things I could have done better, things that I wish I knew. I, I don't regret going at all. Sometimes you go, oh, sh should I have lasted a little bit longer there? You know what? It was meant to happen the way it did. Yeah. And then going back to Sacramento without having anything lined up, 
it's a gamble. And I lost out on a couple of job interviews. Like I had opportunities where I interviewed for a couple of jobs. I felt really good about the advanced stages and lost out. And you start to doubt yourself a little bit, especially mm -hmm. when you're young in your career. Eventually I, I get back and start hosting a show on, on Sports 1140. And that was going great. Did that for a few years. And then the next obstacle was when I got fired. Me and Morgan got fired on, on April uh, 1st, 2016, on April Fool's Day. No one believed it. Friends, family, fans of the show, they thought we were all trolling them. It's like, no, we legit got fired that day. But why that day sticks with me so much, mm -hmm. I didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. They chose to go a different direction. Yeah. But my mindset that day wasn't, oh, what am I going to do? It's like, no, this is what we're going to do. We're yeah. going to launch a podcast. We're going to create content. We're going to learn along the way. And that's been the process. There've been these ups and downs throughout the journey, but I think the downs really, you learn something about yourself in those moments. What are you really about when there's some adversity thrown your way? Mm -hmm. Those like some of the lows are mm -hmm. what stick with me and there are definitely highs. I'm not trying to dismiss it. I'm so grateful with where I'm at right now. I, I try to have that perspective too, where it's not, dude, you work in your hometown. You do a podcast that has grown a ton the last few years. You're doing play by play. You're doing some stuff with NBC Sports California. It's all stuff that's great, but I have a thirst for more. I believe I can do more and I'm mm -hmm. striving to get there. Mm -hmm. I know yeah. that's a very long winded answer, yeah, but no, it's just that's like, great, that's a great one, dude. Yeah. To your point, what you're saying is, yeah, there's highs and lows, but definitely the lows are the ones that definitely stick out to you because it definitely shapes you and it definitely makes you go okay shit what are you gonna, what are you gonna do now like yeah. now that you're here are you just gonna be sour and just let this just kill you or are you gonna get back up and say hey i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah. go out here and i'm gonna yeah. conquer this and do what i gotta do let it fuel you a little bit yeah mm -hmm. I, i've told this story before but i also was at one point i was trying to get an agent and maybe it wasn't the right time at that moment to get one but this one agent sent him my stuff and we were trying to like connect and it, his schedule is crazy, but he had complimented my stuff. And then months go down the road. He, we can't connect. We finally connect. I'm so excited. And probably about four years ago now or four and a half years ago. And he's like, Hey, to be honest. I feel like you've been in Sacramento a long time. Looking at your resume. I feel like you've plateaued. I'd give it a year or two and then move on. And Dang. that stung. It stung mm -hmm. in a big way. But it just, as you get, I, that was like, he injected me with the fuel and the motivation that like no one else could give me. Yeah. Like it was like, boom, okay. And <laughs> I, I, to this day, I, I say, screw that guy. Not because what he said to me and I, I, it's fine. I took it and went, I'm going to prove this person wrong. What irritated me was the fact that he's probably said that to other people who maybe didn't take it the right way and gave up too early. Mm -hmm. And instead of being like uplifting and, and trying to give some, hey, this is what I would try to do. But again, these low moments in your career, what maybe you get humbled a little bit, maybe you get some feedback, maybe whatever it is, I just try to use that as fuel for the fire. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a great lesson for all the listeners that are listening to this is never really give up what you really want to do. And although things might get low, and people might say stuff to you, just keep on going. Is basically what I'm hearing you say. That's a pretty incredible story. And honestly, I've never really heard that story. So you're giving me gems here that I haven't really heard about. So speaking on broadcasting, when you moved to San Francisco, you were saying that you didn't regret that decision, correct? Right. I wanted to ask a follow-up question, but I totally forgot. Maybe it'll come back. back. Yeah, it's fine. I felt like overwhelmed at times by that situation. There was just a lot of, as a producer there of a morning show at a new station, there was a lot of pressure to compete against this huge sports station, KNBR. That's a heritage brand that's been there for years. Mm -hmm. And part of my responsibility was to book guests on a show. Mm -hmm. I am also a very creative person. I'm a, I'm a creative, so I like come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. And I felt like... There was this immense amount of pressure to book like four to five guests every single day for a show that airs six to 10 a.m. Oh, and wow. when you didn't book one, you just felt so low or you felt like you were disappointing people. And I felt like my life was being, I didn't like the producer grind of booking guests. Mm -hmm. A guest booking job is stressful because mm -hmm. you are relying on someone to, to say yes to you, someone that doesn't even know you. And yeah. you have to build relationships over time. And I felt like guests didn't. To me, the show 
is what people come to. If mm -hmm. you can add good guests to it along the way, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I want good guests. Yeah. But if you're just booking a guest to book a guest, how does that do anything for the listener and the show? Yeah. So anyway, I, I think I struggled with that notion, which led to me led me to go, you know what? I can't do this anymore. I'm not happy. I need to figure out what's going to make me happy. So mm -hmm. I quit after a year. And you were speaking about you started that podcast right after that, too. Can you talk to me? A little bit what went into your decision as far as like all right let's start a podcast after we got let go on april 1st 2016 and that's we, a show with jay ross right well, well no so we had a show with jason ross so uh, what happened okay. was we had this gr really great show midday show with me jason and morgan mm -hmm. and then a couple of years in they're like hey the morning show struggling mm -hmm. we're gonna make a change we're gonna take you and morgan from the midday show and put you in the morning with Carmichael Dave. And it just, the chemistry wasn't there, man. I right, talked about this before. There's no like ill will anymore. I don't, I just don't care about it, but it was a mistake. They shouldn't have put us there. Like they I mean, kept, you had a good show going. Let's yeah. keep building in it. And you put two pieces with someone else and it just, it never worked. Mm -hmm. The floor, yeah. it just wasn't there. Once that ended, we're like, we have to, I've always been into technology and trying new things. I think in this business, it's so important to evolve. And I was, I've always felt like radio has been behind in technology. I remember when I first got on the radio, I'm going, how come I can't stream a radio station online? I don't get, we don't stream this station. I would get so <laughs> irritated by that. Yeah, and yeah, eventually yeah. they do that. But once we got like, oh, it's like, how are we going to keep this going? And we're like, oh, we should, we should do a podcast. Oh, we can go live with it. Oh, and we could put it on YouTube. Let's just try it out. Dude, mm -hmm. Looking back at it, it was, it didn't look great. Right? Yeah, we were learning, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But your idea was there. Mm -hmm. So even if you look at our stuff from two years ago, it's, oh man, we had a really bad camera there. We didn't do the graphic or the background. Yeah. Anyway, the thought of the podcast was, the initial thought was, we need to keep our voices out there. We can't disappear because then you get mm -hmm. forgotten. Yeah. We're going to capitalize it. on them. Mm -hmm. We're going to create content. And our initial thing was we we're going to do a sports rate, like kind of a sports podcast, a broad sports mm -hmm. podcast. We talk Kings for sure, but we're going to hit other topics. Mm -hmm. That's evolved. Now we, our podcast is mainly Kings and NBA. We're doing a podcast that Obviously, we're so focused on the Kings, but we're also mm -hmm. creating content for YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's just evolving. It, that, that's the biggest thing. And that was our motivation. We didn't know where it was going. We didn't know what it was going to lead to. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing. You can't predict this journey. You can't. Yeah. It's, I think the biggest thing I tell people is like, God, if you can work hard, build true relationships, evolve, be honest with yourself, hold yourself accountable, I think you can make it in this business. You have to have talent too. No, absolutely. But you yeah. all... You have to have the drive and the ability to evolve. I feel like that's a great answer. And we'll chat about this a little bit more again later, but I feel like it's one of those things where people from the outside, I could see they think that maybe things like this is easy content creating and editing, which is the biggest hassle. Yeah, I'm pretty early in this space. Obviously you've been doing it for a while now, but. People out there just don't know really what it takes to, you know, do a podcast, the inside and outs of doing a podcast. And the podcast world is booming right now, especially with former NBA players left and right. Everyone's coming out with a podcast and it just seems like everything is booming right now as far as the podcast world. It's a crowded space. It's a mm -hmm. competitive space. Mm -hmm. And that's where you have to continue to evolve. Yeah. That's what I always say, especially how you talk about the game of basketball. Yeah. I think nowadays fans are smarter than ever. If you think back to when sports radio was booming in the 90s or early 2000s, not every single game was on TV. Not every single game was accessible, right? Yeah. You relied on reading a newspaper the next day, maybe read an article to find out what happened, mm -hmm. and you went to sports radio. They're the experts. They know what happened. They watched the game or they didn't. They, yeah. they know something we don't know. Yeah, yeah. Truthfuls are gone. Like fans, it's a mystery. Mm -hmm. dude, fans can watch every game. They can mm -hmm. go back on YouTube. They can, they have yep. advanced analytics that no one had access to. If you are a casual, you're not going to last. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think that that's where it's on people who are talking about the game to up mm -hmm. their game, mm -hmm. to understand the game at a different level. And that's where I'm like, all right, I have to be honest with you, what can I do better? to talk about the game. Yeah. I, I'm not 
dropping weird takes. You have to to be locked in. And that's another reason why I stopped doing the broad sports talk thing. I, I'm like, I can't keep up honestly with the way I want to talk about things, watching the NBA, NFL, baseball. Oh, what about their big, this box? I can't keep, I can enjoy those things, Mm -hmm. but to talk about the way I want to talk about it, I have to pick one and I love basketball. Yeah. And great choice. Great choice. Yeah. That is a lot, a lot of sports, everything. There's stuff going on every single day, off season. Everything is always going on. It's switching gears a little bit now, Deuce. I know that you're a very busy guy, demanding schedule. I want to talk about your free time and hobbies. What do you enjoy doing in your free time for fun? Yeah. During the season, there isn't a ton of free time, which is fine. I always tell people the the season is like a marathon. You're just trying to survive. All right, keep going, keep going. And then you get to the off season, you go, oh, okay. And so you like, you know, I don't have games. Like, and I, it's just, it's a different type of flow. Mm-hmm. So if I try to, I'm obsessed with this. Okay, mm-hmm. so I'm always looking at ways to get better my development in the off season, mm-hmm. looking for inspirations. I, I think one thing we try to do is consume more than just sports and yeah. podcasts. So during this time, it's like we're, we're recording this the day before the NBA draft. I feel like I've been so focused on NBA draft stuff, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But once that's over, I'm consuming comedy podcasts that I, right. I vibe with. I'm like, oh, I like this. What can we do to bring it to our podcast? If I can now, if you want me to take a step away from that, like the podcast of what else I do, mm-hmm. enjoy hanging out with the pops. I've been spending a lot of time exploring Sacramento. I'm born and raised in Sacramento, mm-hmm. but there, I, I'm trying to go to like restaurants I've never been to, spots I've never been to, mm-hmm. taking tours of museums and stuff I've never done, and mm-hmm. just like soaking in the history of Sacramento, learning more about how this city has changed over the years oh, for yeah. the worse in some ways, but. <laughs> For sure. Also, oh, where is it headed? There's mm-hmm. some good things happening too. So exploring the city, I like going to comedy shows, mm-hmm. working out, playing basketball. So that's those are my outside hobbies. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I see you and Morgan been definitely exploring SAC a little bit and seeing what, right. like all the tours that there is. Sometimes you don't even know there's a tour. You can go tour this mansion or you can go check out about the, one of the oldest bars in Sacramento. I feel like Sacramento definitely That's has a lot of thing. history. It does. And I think sometimes, and I, I'm so guilty of this, is we're always trying to go somewhere else to mm-hmm. see yeah. places. I'm like, well, what about in your own backyard? Yeah. Are there things you haven't seen yet? Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. SAC is usually the butt of jokes, especially with like, People in the social media, oh, who's going to go to SAC? When I go to SAC, like, I just stay in my hotel or whatever. But I feel like there is a lot of things to do in Sacramento, even though it's not the glitz and glamour of Los Angeles or anything like that. I, I feel like Sacramento does have a lot to offer. Oh, There's A lot of out-of-towners. You got to really explore. Know. People, that's the thing. People go to the city sometimes and they go, like, a block around their hotel they're staying. <laughs> but you got to go walk around. Yeah, go yeah. walk miles through a city. Yeah. Explore. Talk to people. Yeah, that's and I that's why I love going to new cities too, is, and or different parts of a city, mm-hmm. and just feeling different types of energy. Yeah. It's cool. Like I went to New Orleans for the first time for the Kings playing game, oh, and okay. the energy there. Oh yeah, man, the food there, the people. I was like, <laughs> I'm digging this. Yeah. I'm digging this. But there's so many people who are like, oh, there's nothing around my hotel. I just went to the Starbucks and had breakfast. I'm like, yeah. that's on you. Walk around the city a little bit, and you'll yeah. notice that Sacramento has a lot of cool things. Good weather especially downtown all the trees Mm -hmm. beautiful yeah yeah and i feel like we're in a great location because of lake tahoe as well we have napa we have the area we are essentially in a in in a good location to embark where we want to go you know i feel like it's a great location speaking about demanding work can you give us like a typical game day like what that looks like for you say for example it's a king's game on a friday night at 7 p.m could you give us a rundown of what your day might look like yeah. king's game on a friday night let's say it just depends on the schedule let's just say i'm on nbc sports california that night i also do some work with the king's radio broadcast i'll do my duties with that in the morning you should get that done in the morning my game prep in the morning so i'm getting mm-hmm. some game prep done in the mm-hmm. morning usually get a workout into that's my go. my new thing that i got late okay. in the year because i was like with the schedule i'm big on that like yeah. i went through months of not working out, feeling like crap, you're not yeah. doing, not treating yourself right. Last year after the All-Star break, during the All-Star break, I was like, let's get in this routine. I started doing that a lot, which helped me a lot just from an energy per- perspective. So 
get that workout in, get prepped for the game. Usually I've got walk the dogs and then I, I got like a gap between noon and three okay. where it's like, okay, I, I'm good. I usually get to the arena around 3.30. I like getting there early. I like four hours. I know it seems crazy, right? But you get there, you get settled in, you put your stuff away, get set up. If I'm doing TV, by the way, let me rewind. If I'm doing mm -hmm. TV that night, mm -hmm. I'm hopping on a call with producers in the morning. We're talking about ideas for the show. Hey, I want to talk okay. about Keon Ellis's defense. Hey, can we get tape of this? Oh, I have these three plays I want to go over. What do you think we should talk about with this Kings Warriors matchup? Like all the different angles. So yeah, okay. we go through that. We go through a rundown. Okay. Then there's a gap. I got to get ready and figure out what the hell I'm going to put on and wear tonight. Mm -hmm. My least favorite thing. Mm -hmm. Get to that arena around 3.30, like I said, 3.30, 4 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Guys are usually warming up. I'm a big, let me go watch guys just go through the workout. A little okay. pregame workout. Watching the young guys. Maybe you're catching up with a coach a little bit. You're just talking to people. It's a mm -hmm. good way to vibes and to see what's happening, how everything's going. And then... Pre-game is usually a half hour before, so it starts at 6.30. So by mm -hmm. 6, I'm going up to the set, getting all mic'd up, mm -hmm. everything done, uh, going over the rundown a little bit more, last minute prep, talking to whoever's hosting, if it's Morgan, whoever, yeah. just going over what we're going to talk about. And then show starts. We lock in for yeah. 23 minutes is usually what it is with commercials. Mm -hmm. Once that's off, your piece is out. Game's about to start. I got the laptop open, mm -hmm. typing away. I'm like... I'm charting lineups. I'm taking notes, things I mm -hmm. want to talk about, texting a producer. Hey, at halftime, let's talk about this. Mm -hmm. Just watching the game and, and locking yeah. in and getting ready for, getting my thoughts together for the halftime show and the postgame show. Yeah. After that's done, all right, head back, get ready for the podcast. We go live after every single game. So getting home by 1030, 1045, depending on the game. Yeah. Depending on how long the game goes, we'll go an hour, then do all the editing, posting, usually in bed by 2, 230. And there you go. Wow. That's quite a day. Let's run through. Mm -hmm. It's long for sure. But yeah. I, I always go, you're watching basketball. Yeah. You you would not trade this for anything. Hey, yeah. You do, you're doing what you love. So at the end of the day, yeah. come on, like I'm living my dream. A couple of things of what you mentioned there. Let's quickly talk about ooh, a lot of people. Oh, yes. You guys are pretty good about recording right after the games. That's yeah. very good. I, I don't see a lot of people doing that and it's like with all your schedule and what you have to do and all of that like how do you get the energy to keep doing that right after maybe um, because i'm looking at it from also my point of view of after i watch a game obviously i'm not doing what you do but still staying locked in even after the game how do you go about that i think the biggest challenge is i love the team mm -hmm. and so i feel when it's a tough loss, I, there's sometimes I'm like, I don't want to do a podcast because it, sometimes it's just, I'm going to look at the chat. I like engaging with her live chat and when it, it's like toxic city dooming, oh, this guy is falling because they lost one game in November. I'm just like, all right, I'm going to get irritated by something someone said in there or it's going to distract me, but I, I don't want to ignore it because I want to engage. Like, it's just this fine line. So there have been definitely moments like, I don't feel like doing it. But to me, mm -hmm. if we commit to going live after every game, mm -hmm. we're going live after every game. It's is something we'll do forever. No, I'm not going to say that. I, I, I can't imagine like I'm 50 something years old. Going, All right. We, uh, let's talk about it. Who knows what the world's going to be like then in technology. But yeah, I see. I think there's something about doing it immediately. Now, there's mm -hmm. sometimes I wish like. If we did the next day, it's, you know what? Maybe I missed a topic or an angle that I didn't notice during the game that got brought up the next day. Oh, I wish I would have saw that. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have noticed it live. Mm -hmm. But for me, it's it's a chance to talk about the game. I think it's fresh on your mind. Mm -hmm. I've got the angles I want to talk about. And there's so many games that happen. It's like doing it the next day. Yep. It's all I don't. Yep. I want to get it fresh. I yep. want people because their emotions are high right after a game for good or bad. If it's a win. We're all feeling juiced. If it's a loss, ugh, depending on the loss. Yeah. And then for the people who watch the next day or download the next day, mm -hmm. they're right in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's in their podcast feed uh, for the audio, probably about 205 or maybe 130. Like, the page. They get it. And mm -hmm. so when they're up, they get it. So yeah, I think we've tried to be smarter in terms of like, when we started doing this during the pandemic, it felt, hey, we would talk. We'd be on for two hours sometimes after a game. Just like with a different time. flow. Yeah. Yeah. And now yeah. it's, hey, there's 82 of these. Like, we can go an hour tonight. 
yeah and, and it's okay mm -hmm. so you, you change it up but i don't know to answer your question it's just it's fresh on your mind yeah and it's, let's talk about this now we just witnessed it so let's go on yeah. and i also think for for fans it's I, I feel this way too if i didn't do the podcast after the game i'm gonna tell you what i'd be doing i'd be on social media reading about it or yeah. i'd be on reddit yeah. reading about it it's like why not just come on and talk about it like oh, just talk man. about it where it's on your mind yeah and then it's the moments of like joy that you feel after a fun win mm -hmm. i'm all fired up it's yep. just fun it makes it worth it yeah and then light the beam and everybody goes take pictures and yeah. everyone's feeling good before the next game like, that's a good answer it says what you're saying you're very committed and just on it and yet yeah, you are right staying fresh and because yeah if you wait too long then there's already other things that are already going on might have already missed your chance by then so, yeah uh, there are some nights too you go man no one's gonna watch tonight it was a bad yeah. loss like when they lose by 30 you're just like yeah. what are we even say about this one and yeah. i also i don't know if i get as i get older i feel this way but i don't take joy in hey let's just scream and yell about a game yeah. oh, yeah. I'm a, like there are moments you, that's appropriate and to be frustrated and stuff but like it goes back to what i said it's a kid's game man mm -hmm. i i told morgan during some of the tough times last year because there were more obstacles last year that the kings faced and some adversity mm -hmm. the vibes are different it was always going to be different is here's the reality is no matter win or lose we have to still have fun uh -huh. it doesn't mean we yeah. say the game was fun and we try to paint a rosy picture this is it was a juba right yeah. it's like no no we have to still smile and yeah. laugh and have moments where we prod each other and show our personality and yeah. play a game yeah. and we i don't know that anyone's going to be excited to listen to a podcast if it's two people just bitching yeah. and complaining yeah. the whole yeah. time you know what i mean yeah. so exactly striking the balance of oh so frustrating let's have some fun yeah you know what i mean yeah i like that take and to speak about your routine as well you talked about watching the players go through their routine is there one player maybe this particular season uh that you were just whoa like he's going hella hard or damn i didn't know he works out that hard no, I, it's not even so much that like it's because I, I don't think these guys go that hard in their pregame like mm -hmm. routines, but I'm always yeah. interested in, OK, this guy is working on this specific thing. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, mm -hmm. Egan's working on his dribbling over and mm -hmm. over there. Mm -hmm. This is part of his routine. Every game mm -hmm. he does this routine or, oh, wow, this guy is making everything right mm -hmm. now. Or mm -hmm. sometimes you go, this guy is missing everything. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a player. It's like they're not making anything in warmups and I'm going. Oh my God, they're going to be bad tonight. And then yeah. they come out and they say, oh, there's 35. You're like, okay, what does any of this mean? So I it's cool. See. And I just, like, I'm just observant too. I like seeing, oh, this coach is very good at communicating mm. this aspect of the game. Or, oh, this guy could be a head coach in the future. Yeah. Oh, these players really bond with each other. Just noticing those type of elements is kind yeah. of fun. That's pretty cool. You're right there by the action. And uh, yeah, there's small little cues that you can pick up on that. Not everybody else can. Um, and speaking about that, Warriors and Kings game last season, this is before the whole talk about Clay and, hey, Clay might lead. It was the first playing game that they played. And yeah. I, don't know, I don't know if it Clay's like routine, but he was just in the corner, just like sitting down by himself, just head down. And mm -hmm. it's kind of like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, he's not confident. Something is off about Clay. Uh, negotiation talks, maybe putting him down. Like, what's going on? Yeah. But yeah, yeah really Clay's year is interesting because I think that was clearly a distraction for him this year. Mm -hmm. I think there was a level of like him feeling disrespected mm -hmm. by the initial offer, not feeling like they were willing to commit to him, especially yeah. with what he feels like he's been able to accomplish with that organization, what mm -hmm. he has meant to their championship teams, what he has been through as a player with the injuries he's had to overcome. Yeah, it's tough. Yeah, it's tough. It There's so tough. many layers to sports, and I think we're getting better as a society. I don't know. Maybe we're not. I, I, part of me wants to think we're getting better as a society of humanizing these athletes. Mm -hmm. The reason I backtracked on that statement is because then you see how gambling's shifted things and how people are oh, like, yeah, going at players like, oh, I had your, I just needed you to go over 23 and a half. Yeah. You suck. Oh, you lost me money. I can't believe you did yeah. this. I don't like that part yeah, of it. I yeah, don't. But I, yeah. I think there's also a part where I think there are many people who are like, hey, this guy, he's trying. He's struggling right now, but yeah. you're like a struggle. I'm not good every day. I've had many podcasts where I go after him like, damn. Yeah. 
what happened to me tonight? Yeah. I was not smooth or I missed this. Who? Yeah. I suck. We were like, man, I got a little triggered at this thing. And so I think humanizing athletes and coaches is very important. For sure. I think it hit it right on the nail because hey, at the end of the day, they're just a human being. And after the game is done, they still got to go back to their families. And yeah. Of course, yeah, they might be thinking about the loss, but at the end of the day, like, like you keep saying, like, it's just basketball, you know, like, things going to move on. Like, you're going to treat these people like human beings and you can't treat them like a bot. Like, that's not what they are. This is an actual right. human being. I think that's what And that's the thing. At. These human beings do superhuman things. Yes. So I think sometimes we put them at this on like, why did they do that? It's like, yes. Hello, man. It's, yes. it's, guess what? These are a lot of, these are good players. Yeah. And uh, like Kyrie wasn't as good against Boston. Why was that? Oh, I, maybe it is the Boston environment that, that got to him a little bit because of what happened there at the end for him, how he yeah. feels and all mm -hmm. that. Or maybe, hey, the Celtics are just better. And yeah. they've got defenders everywhere who can defend multiple positions. And Crazy. it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Mm -hmm. it's, guess what? One team can win a championship every year. Yeah. One. Yeah. Not easy. Yeah. The, we're not seeing a whole bunch of back-to-back -back champions anymore. Was it six straight years? Six different champions? Yeah. Harder than ever. And that's a pretty good stat. Yeah, I did. I did see that recently as well. It's very hard. It's very hard to go back to back these days. And let's yeah. see if the Boston Celtics are able to do that. Sticking on the hardwood here, uh, do some sticking with the Sacramento Kings. You mentioned that you went to the playing game in New Orleans yeah. where the Kings ended up losing that game. And the Kings lost to the Pelicans five straight times last year. And, yeah, exactly. And Six, and believe it or not. That, yeah. that was just, yeah, that was tough before that one. But can you maybe sum up the Kings season in a few sentences? Wow. Um, it was a year with higher expectations. It was a year that they were not going to be overlooked by any team. It was a year where they had a little more adversity and they weren't good enough in a West that was better. I think. They had flaws that most people saw before the season, and those flaws were on display throughout the year at the trade deadline. They were on mm -hmm. display, and they didn't make any moves. Teams around them did. Mm -hmm. And then even going back to last offseason, they didn't really address their, some of their core weaknesses. They decided to like, bring the main people back again. Yeah. And I think that, in hindsight, was probably not the best idea in a Western conference that was a little healthier, mm -hmm. that was deeper, that was more mm -hmm. talented. It's tough to look at a 46 win season and go, oh, that was a disappointment. But when you don't make the playoffs, that's how, how you're going to feel. So I don't think they're far away, but it's fair to say last year was a definitely a disappointment, especially considering what happened the year before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you talk about expectation too, because after the high of making the playoffs for the first time in 16 years, tough series for the Kings and the Warriors that were stepping up going crazy for 51 piece right here at home. But I think the biggest thing is just expectation. They were supposed to take another step above because it's like, all right, you had a really good season, but let's notch it up a little bit. But I want to also hear you say is like they kept the core and everything is basically staying the same. And they picked up Sasha, Chris Duarte. But yeah, in the Wild Wild West, those moves are not really going to move the needle. Well, they didn't hit, right? And you look at like yeah. Dallas, their yeah. moves on paper. Yeah. Last off season, they signed Dante Exum and Derek Jones Jr. Junior, to like minimum yeah. deals. Yeah. No one was going, hey, this is going to propel them to the NBA finals. Both those guys played really well for them. It still wasn't enough. They needed mm -hmm. Kyrie to get healthy. And for then they sure. went, hey, we got Grant Williams. That move, it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. You know what? We're going to cut bait early. We're not going to try to prove that we we're right. We're going to be honest and evolve and go, Let's get rid of him and let's see if we can take a chance to get PJ Washington. Mm -hmm. It's being that type of aggressive, being aggressive mm -hmm. to try to get those results. And mm -hmm. it's tough, man. It's, um, I try to have the perspective of enjoying these moments too, right? Mm -hmm. Because success is not always, li it's not linear, linear. right? Mm -hmm. Like you don't just go, Hey, you just go straight up, right? Yeah. Like even though good Kings teams got bounced in the first round multiple years, boom, years. Boom. then you got second round. Okay. Boom. Bounce. In the right, conference right. finals. And then people thought after the conference finals when they lost the Lakers, next year will be our year. <laughs> Chris Weber did hurt. And yeah. guess what? They never got back to the, yeah. the conference finals. They haven't been back since. So, yeah, I mean, the moves that they did make were swings and misses. You could tell yourself, hey, Duarte, play, hey, maybe a change of scenery. He had a good rookie year. He knows mm -hmm. some bonus. Mm -hmm. Take a chance on him. Maybe his defense is better. And 
that's a little bit of an upgrade. He fills the Terrence Davis role or mm-hmm. Sasha, man, you're early game MVP. He moves up the ball. He could shoot it. You always yeah. need more shooting. Like that'll work. He was now the rotation gets hurt. Mm-hmm. They swung and missed. That yeah. happened too. But now it's like, all right, how do you, sure. everyone should be honest with themselves from Mike Brown to the front office, to the players. What can we do better? We expected to make noise. We mm-hmm. didn't make noise. Yeah. Now we got to get back in this. And I'm looking around the West going, Houston's getting better. San Antonio's getting to get better. Memphis. Yeah. It's going to be tough. Yeah. But they need to make moves, right? They need to make moves. I know it's one day removed from the NBA draft and we're already seeing a couple of domino effects, but they definitely do got to start making moves. If they want to be better, they want to be better for sure. And stay on a specific player, Domas. Really big fan of Domas's game and... This past season was the best that he's looked in the Kings uniform. He had that streak of 61 straight double-doubles, which was talked about. But let's just be honest. He wasn't getting talked about like when Russell Westbrook had that amazing year. After every single game, it was on ESPN right after. He missed out on the All-Star game. But the record that he had, it, ha- it hasn't been done for a long time since the merger back in 70, uh, 76 season. But can you talk to me a little bit? Why is Domas not appreciated as much? I've liked Domas since he was with the Pacers. And he's a guy I've wanted on the Kings for a long time. I didn't think he was going to be able to get acquired. And they landed him mm-hmm. in that trade for Halliburton. I love Sabonis' game. And there's a lot of people who want to nitpick. Mm-hmm. He's not perfect. And I, I have a list of things I could talk about. Like, Sabonis, if you just did this better... You're in the MVP conversation for sure. And the Kings are going to another level, but I'm sorry. This guy plays hard. He's unselfish. Maybe sometimes to a fault. He's the best rebounder in the game. He's tough. He plays injured. He plays every night. What's not to like. I've always loved big guys who can pass the ball. Chris Weber, Vlade Divac, Brad Miller. So when I see a guy like him, wanting to get guys involved. Mm-hmm. I love his game. Why isn't he appreciated? He gets nitpicked. Oh, he doesn't block shots. Okay. Guess what? He's not, he doesn't have a 7'7 seven, seven wingspan. That's just what it is. Mm-hmm. He's what, 6'11", and he's got a 6'11 wingspan. He's not super long. He's not yeah. a shot blocker. Mm-hmm. But does he do other things well? Does he compete defensively? I think for him, it's about winning to get that respect at another level. I also go this. We talk so much about how he doesn't get the love and the attention. He's made the All-NBA team in back-to-back years. He's getting some love and attention for what he's accomplishing. If he's not getting talked about on NBA Today, that's a bigger issue that I think ESPN has with how they talk about things. It's a fact. Lakers and Warriors are going to be talked about most than the Knicks. Those are the big storylines. It's just reality. It's not going to change. And that's why there are other content creators who are killing it in the game because Basketball fans want more yes. of the other teams. They want to hear about mm-hmm. Memphis. They want to hear about Charlotte, Sacramento. They yeah. want that type of stuff. And now there's ways to access it. But I, I think for Sabonis, it's like the King, the Kings would have to make some serious noise winning and him continue to do what he does. But I think for him, it's also challenging himself to elevate his game to the, another level. He's got to take the mid-range shot. I would also say yes. he's got to take more threes. threes if yeah. he can evolve those aspects of the game, then people aren't going to be talking about him the same way. Mm-hmm. And it, the Kings will be one of the better teams in the West. If he, if Sabonis comes out and starts shooting four threes a game and hits him at a 7% clip, that changes the Kings offense and spacing. If when yes. he is left open now, he doesn't hesitate and he takes the three, that changes things. But I yeah. think Sacramento, the front office can do more to help him out too with some additional size. There's a lot on his plate to deal with every single night. Yeah. And speaking about that last point that you just made right there, Deuce, uh, I feel feel like it's really important. Size is very important in the West in general, in the NBA. And you talked about maybe the front office maybe need to help him out there as well. Who are some people that maybe you think could be a great asset to help? Is there maybe certain players that you think the Kings should go after? As far as bigs? We, we, we've heard the rumors about Kyle Kuzma for years, and mm-hmm. he is not a perfect player by any means, but I look at him and go, he would slot in right perfectly at the four spot for Sacramento. And what I like about his game is he plays with pace. He's a good playmaker. He's an athlete. 
And I do think he has some defensive upside that maybe was not has not been shown yeah. with the Washington Wizards. Okay. I wish he shot the three better, a little more efficiently, but I, I that's a guy I would take a chance on if available. I love Brandon Ingram too. I just think that's going to be more expensive. The reality is I don't think the Kings are that far away from really making a little more noise. I'm not going to say championship level. There, There's levels to that. Mm -hmm. But they just... When, I look at last year's roster. I've talked to Morgan about this. Like Harrison Barnes, Sasha, Trey. Not a ton of athleticism there, mm -hmm. right? In, in, in those spots. Mm -hmm. And I think versatility is a big thing. You need versatility yeah. and length. That would go a long way. So many people talk about, oh, you need a shot blocker. I don't buy that. Some of the greatest rim protection is perimeter defense. Mm -hmm. Keeping yeah. your guy... From getting in the paint yeah. if you don't have to protect the paint it's not about just blocking shots no you don't want guys getting to the rim that can't happen and have a second live defensive block shot sure getting paint touches can kill you so you have to have guys that can guard look at the celtics look at what minnesota has built even oh, though yeah. they have a disappointing finish mm -hmm. even the mavs what they did defensively with their length you need more of that and so sacramento definitely has to target those areas yeah, I'm really excited to see what the Kings do end up doing as far as that. You are 100% right. The Kings do need a little bit more love around the edges. And they're a great defensive team. Uh, they could probably be better. They were probably in the middle of the pack as far as defense. They were middle of the pack mm -hmm. after Keon was put in the starting line. Yeah. They definitely were like top 10 defensive rating. So, yeah. yeah, they improved defensively with having some flaws too. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I think there's another level there. I think the other thing is just improving offensively. We talk so much about the defense, but they need some more consistent shot creation out there too. Mm -hmm. Another guy who can get you a bucket. Once Monk went down, you're looking around going, who else yeah. is going to get me? Who can create a bucket? It was exactly. De'Aaron Fox there. All right, who else? Mm -hmm. And that wasn't good enough. Like, you couldn't rely on Harrison to do that. Keegan is not to that point at mm -hmm. that at this point. He showed some flashes, but not there consistently. For the Kings to really maximize the next few years, it's about acquiring someone else that can get a bucket, but Keegan has to take a step. Yeah. If Keegan could take a step, and I think that's what they're banking on, is mm -hmm. Keegan is going to be a really good player in this league, Fox and Sabonis, stay at their level or maybe go a little higher, mm -hmm. then they can have some fun. Yeah, yeah, totally agree. I feel like they got better right after the All-Star break. I think I heard Fox talk about it in an interview. They kind of really jump on that and be better on the defensive end because they were just letting way too many easy buckets. I feel like that's yeah. that was probably one of the bigger criticisms last year is just teams were just going at the rim so easily. Dunks, lobs, scoring a lot in the paint. That was probably one of the more bigger criticisms. And then also, Deuce, you talked to me about the Kings free throw shooting, man. It's so frustrating. Yeah, and what's weird about it too is like, they were near the bottom of the NBA yeah. most of the year mm -hmm. last year. The year before, they were like a 70, 79%, which is great, but mm -hmm. it was way better. Look, you're the two guys who get to the free throw line the most are Fox and Sabonis. Mm -hmm. Fox mm -hmm. got a lot better as the season went on. I don't have the stats in front of me, but yeah. I think post All Star break, he was like 80, over 80% at mm -hmm. the free throw line. He's got to do that consistently, mm -hmm. right? Consistency yeah. is everything. The guy that has to shoot him better is Sabonis. Sabonis. And yeah. He got to line a lot, was not good at the free throw line. Mm -hmm. Sabonis, so I'm realistic. I don't need him shooting 90% of the line, 80%. You got to, can you get me to 75? Mm -hmm. Can you get me 73 to 75? Yeah. He's capable of it. And so those things matter. And I'm not going to act like those are the reasons why the Kings missed the playoffs, but dude, there are games you look back on where you go, yeah. hey, they make their free throws late in the game. They win the game. Mm -hmm. And a couple of games here or there, you're out of the play-in and you're yeah. playing a first-round series. And maybe depending on the matchup, you could win that series. The what-ifs yes. go on and on and on, right? Yeah. And look, Malik missed some key free throws the he games did. too. So he did. It, you got to lock in. And I don't yeah. know what that is, right? Like, yeah. uh, like Monk, you're a good free throw shooter. Go make your guy. Make your free throws. Mm -hmm. You know this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's what's always, it was very fascinating to see the drop-off. Yeah, that wasn't very good to think at all either. Because you're 100% right. Some of those games, if they had just made a couple of free throws, yeah, they could have possibly won the game. Milwaukee, Phoenix, oh, they have beat Chicago, I think, with a win after they were up 30 because they, they finally made some free throws oh, down yes, the stretch. That, the win in Minnesota without fog. Again, mm -hmm. yeah. you're just like, come on, guys. Yeah, just, just make your free throws. Fact is, I definitely want the Kings to get better on uh, their free throw shooting and just points in the paint with the opponent. Uh, you have to be able to protect the paint, man. Uh, we got to, especially when you play a lot of teams in the West here.
right? I just think you start getting the king, there's a lot of teams run pick and roll. And then, okay, if your Sabonis is out on the perimeter in the pick and roll situation, the weak side defense has to be there. And sometimes a weak side defense is not there. Or if it is there, mm -hmm. the length isn't there, right? Mm -hmm. The athleticism is not there. So it, it's crazy. Sometimes it's one breakdown defensively. Mm -hmm. It's not everyone. Like one person makes a mistake, especially in today's game. Yeah. These players can shoot it better. The floor is spaced out mm -hmm. more than ever. Players have more skill than ever. It, a lot of these guys can shoot, pass, mm -hmm. rebound, like they're versatile. Yeah. And so you have to have the pieces in place and be locked in at all times, talking, yeah. all that stuff. Yeah, no, it's definitely a team effort, but yeah, you're hundred percent right. And one person getting, getting broken down on the play and that, that breaks up down the whole entire play. Yeah. That small little looking at another player, yep. and, and a small thing like that. Speaking about the Kings, Mike Brown got a contract extension, which is the first time since Rick Adaman, I, I believe. And then Malik Monk, those guys are secured because, hey, let's be honest. I know you and Morgan are going to be talking about it too, those particular Kings player and staff, but it's been a while since that happened. But could you talk to me about why this is important for the city of Sacramento for Mike Brown to get that contract extension that he was really wanting? And then also for Malik, not even wanting to test out free agency when there's other teams that could have had his signature. I think. For years, Sacramento has had instability, right? Mm -hmm. When it comes to coaching, front office, players, mm -hmm. it's hard, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And Mike Brown, and this may not sound significant to other people who watch other teams, but the perspective is this. The Kings, I think, are entering year 40 in Sacramento, the 40th season in Sacramento coming up. And they've had very few winning seasons yeah the only coaches who have had winning seasons in sacramento's history rick adelman and mike brown so that's a total of 10 in four going into a year so 10 and 39. yeah that's insane yeah that is. That's 10 winning seasons yeah and it's two coaches and so for mike brown to establish something here his work's not done and people can nitpick rotations and he sure. could have done this better mm -hmm. for sure yes Hold them accountable. But the reality is, I think he's brought a level of accountability. I think he's brought a level of joy. He's brought respect mm -hmm. back to a team that hasn't had that, a franchise that hasn't had that in a long time. And I think he's done a good job of assembling a staff that he trusts and that, that the, the players vibe with. And those things matter. And so keeping him around and showing the confidence like, hey, we know the work's not done, but all these other coaches in the league are getting raises. You have a contract that could be coming up. Let's take care of this now. Yeah. And they got it done. And guess what? He gets a raise. There's expectations that come with that raise too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. I'm all about it. But you need that stability. And for Malik, he just means so much to this team on and off the court. And his journey has been crazy, right? Lottery mm -hmm. pick goes to the Hornets, up and down, almost out of the league. Then he's a free agent. Anyone going to pick me up? Signs a minimum deal with the Lakers. Lakers. Mm -hmm. Has a good run there, right? Yeah. Becomes a free yeah. agent. Not a whole bunch of suitors. Sacramento ends up signing him. And he has just shown now, as he has matured, he has grown and been given the opportunity, earned the opportunity, what he can do out on the court. Mm -hmm. The guy's a special talent. He really is. And his ability, his confidence, the, the joy he plays with, mm -hmm. the passion he plays with, setting his teammates up, the swagger, all yeah. these things matter and on and off the court. And I think it was, I didn't think he was going to come back. I thought he was going to go get paid somewhere else, but yeah. I think the reality is maybe that the money they thought was out there wasn't going to be to the level that maybe they thought he was going to get a raise no matter what in Sacramento, for sure, for sure. but getting a little more somewhere else with maybe a more situation or a situation he's not familiar with wasn't worth it. He knows Sacramento, mm -hmm. he knows De'Aaron Fox, he knows Mike Brown. He likes the city. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's how we looked at it. And I think it's big that Sacramento got that done before free agency started. Exactly. Officially. That was cool. exactly. Yeah. The free agency starts next week, right? June 30th. Yeah. June 30th is when it's, it gets crazy. Yeah. We're right around the corner. So it's really important that the Kings really locked in these two pieces before the draft and the free agency, right? Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, I feel like this has been talked about because when he resigned, every, everyone was going crazy. And, and I did see your video where you were just basically throwing in the white towel and saying, oh, all right, I'm just getting ready for Billy to just leave anyway. And then 
<laughs> shortly right after he yeah he signs that deal. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, Malik he's definitely the heartbeat of that second unit. Like him and Trey, those are the guys that come off the bench for the Kings that really give him a spark. And I've heard people talk about like Malik should be starting. He's so good. He should be starting. Take, you know, take a pause because he's a great six man guy. He probably could be starting with the Kings. But can you talk to me? What do you think about Malik's role? And do you believe he should be a starter? There are times last year I was like, Herder struggling. Let's just put your best five out there. Let's go. And he's part of your best five. I'm not yeah. against the idea of him starting. I just think now with the emergence of Keon Ellis too, it's I'm cool. Yeah. I like the idea of having Keon out there with that group to start the game. And it, the, the level he brings from an, not only defensively, but you know what? He showed he can knock down the three ball. I, I think it's important that Malik is playing close to 30 minutes a night though. Mm -hmm. And he has improved defensively. I'm cool with his role. Mm -hmm. And yeah. breaking news, he is too. The, the report came out yesterday that he was given no assurances of what his role would be. It's not like they were, hey, Malik, if you sign with us, you're going to be the starter. It's like, no, like you may be coming off the bench though. You're gonna, it's what's yeah. best for the team. There's not a player in the league who's, yeah, you know what? I'd rather be a six man. Like you, you at this league, yeah. you've got to have the confidence like you're the best awesome. and that you belong out there and that thirst to, I want to be that guy. Yeah. I'm fine with him in that role because he excels in that role. Mm -hmm. And I think, and the, you know, I think that's the other thing. It's not, hey, it's the bench unit and the starters. He plays with the starters a lot. He closes games a he lot. He does, he does. So mm -hmm. as long as he's a vital part to what they're doing and he's on the court more than he's off, uh, I'm cool with it. Yeah, same here. I'm definitely excited. Everyone in Sacramento is happy. They should get a mural right now if somebody's yeah. not already planning on it, right? He's going to get low. That standing oh, yeah. ovation he's going to get, it's going to be pretty insane. And I think now people are just eager. Okay, what's next? What's next? Right, we got that done. This, this is good. Mike Brown done. Malik, yeah. we got we to get better. So yeah. it's going to be intriguing yeah. to see how it unfolds. Yeah, no, I'm excited to see it. Last follow-up question on this particular subject is the Kings had the 13th pick tomorrow. With that specific, what do you think they should do? Should they go ahead and draft a player or should they flip that and try to get a win-now piece? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, one, you got to be open-minded to it all. If mm -hmm. you're trying to get better, if you have a chance to get a really special player and you're like, actually, I don't want to give up the 13th pick. It's what are we doing here? Go get that special player. If that, if that's going to break the deal, go mm -hmm. get that player. Mm -hmm. I, I do like the idea of like, you, can you, is there a way for you to hold on to the pick and maybe move a pick in the future that's protected mm -hmm. that can get you that player? That way you can to take a swing on someone that maybe could help you down the road at 13 or maybe there's an impact player that can help you now and you get him on a rookie contract that's important for team building with this new collective yeah. bargain agreement mm -hmm. and maybe you trade something down the road that's protected you're just betting on hey if we add this really good player and we draft someone right. at 13 we're in a good spot um yeah, I like that. but you got to be nimble too yeah. so i think there's some talented players that will be available at 13 that could help. I think there are some that won't help next year that you're going to have to be patient with and maybe mm -hmm. see them in Stockton. Yeah. But I, I think it's clear based on some of the reporting out there by the athletic that's no, like Fox wants them to be aggressive. I think our office wants to be aggressive. And mm -hmm. I think coach, I think everyone's on kind of the mindset of, Hey, we have Fox and Sabonis. We got Keegan who we think is going to take a jump. We got to capitalize on this time frame. Yeah. The, the time is now we can't be sitting around yeah. waiting because other teams are going to be making moves too. Yep, exactly. And like you said earlier, the West is getting better and better. And if they do go to 13th pick, I haven't been following all the players. I definitely know some, but I'll, I won't sit here and be like, hey, I'm, a, I'm an expert in this year's draft. Right. Is there one specific player that's maybe the one? There, that we should... It's so funny. It, there's not one. And I don't, that's fair. I've never, there's not just one is what I'm saying. Gotcha. There's so many guys that I like and I struggle with it because I'm not, during the NBA, see, I'm watching NBA games and Kings games all the time. I'm not watching college basketball. I don't have time. So mm -hmm. this time of year, I end up watching a lot of old games mm -hmm. from these college prospects from watching clips mm -hmm. uh, that I have access to. I'm like, oh, it's offensive clips, defensive clips, and you're reading mm -hmm. things. So you try to make the, the most educated, I don't know, guess possible. There's just so many ways. When I thought Malik was going, I was like, go get a guard. Go get Rob Dillingham small, but mm -hmm. can he provide a similar spark to Malik Monk. I really like Devin Carter. The guy's a dog. I think his, his the worst case scenario for him is he's an impactful bench player for you and he plays tough defense. He's six, three with a six, nine wingspan. Mm -hmm. I've been watching a guy who could be a, a, more of a late first round guy, Keyshawn George. I'm like, his stats okay. don't pop out at you, but he's young. He's six, eight. 
He is long. He can handle. He's got good vision, and he can shoot the three a little bit. Mm -hmm. Could be a project guy. Bub Carrington, super mm -hmm. intriguing mm -hmm. prospect out of Pitt, who's mm -hmm. got good size, feel for the game, the vision. He's still you know, he's young. Yeah. Got to be patient with him. The one guy, and I had this sheet in front of me because I don't want to mess up his name, Tijon Salon. He is from France, okay. and he is he's a monster. Okay. The guy is 6'9", long, and you see his body, and you go, this guy, he could be special. He's the ultimate boomer bust guy that you're taking a swing on. He okay. could be a, a complete bust. Yeah. But, man, if you hit with him, a guy yeah. his size, he's got the confidence to shoot threes. He doesn't shoot them well, though. Okay. But okay. he takes some shots. You're like, there's something there. Okay. And it doesn't feel like the mechanics are weird, but he's something there. He plays with a tremendous motor, makes a lot of defensive mistakes. He is young. Yeah, they're wrong. <laughs> wrong it. So, like, my whole point is I just write off all these guys. There's guys I think could help you now. There are guys that can okay. help you later. Tristan De Silva is another guy. That's mm -hmm. a help you now guy. But what's yeah. his ceiling? He could do a lot of good things. He could shoot. He could pass. What is he defensively? Yeah. So, there are a lot of guys out there. I just wonder, I, the more, as we get closer, and I could be dead wrong, I'm like, maybe the Kings just, they're going to punt on this pick and try to trade for someone. We'll see. And they could. So yeah. it would be interesting what they do decide to do with it. Because a lot of people are saying this is not one of the best draft classes. It's not that great. So let's see what happens. Switching gears now a little bit here, Deuce. You've called a lot of games throughout your time. I'm interested to learn about what was your most memorable game that you've ever been at. Either you were there as a spectator during the game or you're actually calling the game. That's really tough, man. I think they're just emotional games. There was a yeah. game when, in 2013. We didn't know if the Kings were going to Seattle or not. And you're walking around after that game, looking at you're, you're soaking it all in going, I think we're, I think you had this belief that the Kings are going to stay, right? It's, yeah. There's, we got this, mm -hmm. but you didn't know. And walking out of that building, not knowing for sure and looking around, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I think the final game at Arco was, there's a little emotions there, just thinking about all the memories from that, the ups and downs, more downs and ups, but also some of the fun playoff games. Yeah. I think the first playoff game in 2016 or in 16 years, uh, last year mm. was special. I mean, 25, 30 minutes before the game, everyone in their seats standing, cheering like crazy sure. before the game outside. Just a complete, like a madhouse. And I get chills thinking about that. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I think those are like the, the moment, the moments that kind of stick with me. There are some big ones. There are some big ones yeah. for sure. Yeah. There were talks about them going to Seattle. And honestly, they might still get a team, right? I think they will. Vegas and Seattle, probably. Vegas so. and Seattle. Yeah. I definitely want Seattle just because my brother lives out there too. So it would be cool to see some They deserve it. Games. Right. Yeah. That'd be nice. That'd be nice. All right. I want to be mindful of your time here, Deuce. So the industry is always evolving. What are some trends or changes do you foresee in the future of sports broadcasting? And how are you pre preparing for them? See the future. I just observe and try to feel it out. I think one thing that's really shifted and it, you know, I think we were on top of it pretty early was going live after games mm -hmm. and when a lot of people weren't. I think there's come big come like the ringer just started doing more YouTube content. They realized, oh, we got our people like this video stuff. They like watching on YouTube. I think it's understanding it's not just one thing. Can you create content? Can you create compelling long form content? Can you con create some compelling short term, uh, short form content? Mm -hmm. TikToks, the mm -hmm. YouTube shorts. We were doing clips after playoff games. Some of them were 10 minutes. Some of them were 25. Sure. Uh, try things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's probably my biggest thing with anyone who's trying to create content. Yeah. Try it. Yeah. It's because it hasn't been done doesn't mean you can't try it. See if it works. Yeah. Watch what other people do. See what they do and go, I don't like that. Or I'm going to try to put my own spin on this. Yeah. And there's been stuff I've learned along the way. I think one of the best things we met with was years back, probably three, four years ago, we met with someone who was going to college who was interested in picking our brains about the industry. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, like, yeah, but what, what, you have any advice for us? What You see what we're doing. Are we missing something? Mm -hmm. He said, you should do more clips from your show. Huh. He goes on YouTube. Yeah, people like shorter stuff. And I was like, man, I was just an oversight. And that since then, I've been really like, yeah. I need to be more observant of what people are doing with clips and types of things. And so we do a podcast, a 
90 minute podcast or a 60 minute podcast, there's probably five, six clips you could make off of that. Oh, yeah. And understanding the importance of uh, graphic and, and channel art and, and cover all those things that mm-hmm. matter, right? Mm-hmm. It's just it's evolving that and learning new skills and seeing what works and what doesn't work. So Fair. as far as trends, I don't know. It's going to be fascinating. I think you're seeing it now where there's more and more independent content creators. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's a really good thing. I think for years it was like, hey, you can only get content from cable and the internet. And now people have the technology to do it and express their views all over the world. Yeah. With the technology we're talking right now on video, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, this is not happening in this form. I think it's great. I think it's awesome. And I, I want more. I think independent creators can't have the chance to thrive. They have a chance to thrive, find their audience, mm-hmm. maximize it, try new things, mm-hmm. form a community. I think the, all those things yeah. matter. Yeah. And a couple of things that you said there, really interesting answer there is the content creating part. And I'm sure maybe you and Morgan have got to this point sometime before where you create something you be unique because that's the way that you got to be is you can't be just like everybody else you got to be unique but is there a moment in time where you get discouraged sometimes looking up the analytics for maybe like a pod it could be like when you guys yeah. used to do it several years ago I'd be like oh man i thought that was the best episode like how come it didn't really hit like this yeah there's i mean i feel that still to this day there's yeah. sometimes I'm like how i don't that didn't pop. Yeah, yeah. There are definitely challenges that like some of it, I need to take a deeper dive into understanding why there's just sometimes, especially with YouTube, it's like recommendations matter. And if you pop up in YouTube recommendations, people vibe with your stuff, you get lucky. We've been focused on trying to grow the NBA side of our YouTube channel, trying to mm-hmm. talk more about the game. And that has really helped people. Like, oh, I really like it. I yeah. listen to King stuff, blah, 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 which is great. The perspective is if you're creating content, Ask yourself why are you do? Why are you doing it? Are you doing it because you, I want views and I want to be famous or if you're, I've always said, if you're in this business to be famous, you're doing, you're not the right path. What you, the stuff you create, the things you can do, could it lead to fame? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. But you, that can't be your reason. Mm -hmm. And there's some people it is their reason. They may have success doing it. But for me, I don't, if I do a video that is done well. And it gets a thousand views. I want more yeah. and I'm going to strive for that. But I go, I created good content and those thousand people liked it. They vibed with mm-hmm. that. I got some good feedback off mm-hmm. it. Okay. How can I take those steps and understanding that it is a process and you're just not going to hit right away. It's crazy. There's sometimes you do a video like we did one on Caitlin Clark's first preseason game that popped off like crazy mm-hmm. that got more views than us having deer and Fox oh, wow. in this year. Really? Right. So. And you go, so why was that? Because mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you this right now. Our yeah. Deanne Fox conversation, I w- in my head, that should have millions of people who have mm-hmm. said that it was good enough to have that. Mm-hmm. It didn't. But it yeah. doesn't change the fact that I'm like, that was a career-defining thing that yeah. made me feel so good. And it, the audience vibed with it. Our audience loved it. It was a special moment in my career. Yeah. So it's trying not to get caught up in the numbers, especially early yeah. on gotcha. when you're creating. It, to me, it's about yeah. creating content. All right, what do you got? What do you got? Mm-hmm. Can you do something good? Can you upgrade as you continue on? Mm-hmm. Can you upgrade your equipment? If you're mm-hmm. making a little money off of it, mm-hmm. don't pocket it. And sometimes you need to, whatever. Mm-hmm. But can you be like, I'm putting that aside because I want to buy this camera or this light or yeah. this computer. So yeah. yeah, it's you just can't get caught up in it. And it's hard sometimes because you go, I just started a podcast. Why isn't it working? And that's where you have to go. I got to try new things. I got to, yeah. and that's why you watch what other people are doing and go, why is it working for them? And, yeah. and don't always just look at the people that have a billion subscribers on YouTube. Look at some of the, like, hey, it's, the first it's got 7,000. Sure. Why is that? Or the four, whatever. And just build from there if that's what you're trying to do. Mm-hmm. But evolve it, be honest with it, and don't get caught up in the numbers. The biggest thing is consistency. It's yeah. the biggest thing. When we first got, started going live after Kings games, during the pandemic, right. let me rewind. Before we started going live in the pandemic, before we had the idea on a walk to go do live after games, we, were, we came back and we started going live in the mornings. We have four people live watching us. Four. Because we weren't consistent. We had four people watching us. And that was a little humbling. And then eventually it turned into 25. Then it was just, then it's we're after games and we got 100 watching tonight. And now there are times thousands are watching live. And then after that, yeah. you got to build it. it, it, it takes it's a time. process. It's a process. Yep. Yeah. What I mean, you say yep. you can't be in love with the end product, right? There's a, there's a whole process in between that. And it's 
a lot of this stuff is very time consuming. So you can't really let certain numbers and all that really get you down. I feel like that's some good advice that you just dropped for the listeners and for myself too, who's just barely getting in it myself. That, that goes a long way. Yeah. Deuce, you, you just patience. Definitely a good one, Deuce. I don't want to take up more of your time here, Deuce. I appreciate you jumping on the pod with me today. One last question I'm going to get you out of this is for all the listeners, how can they keep in contact with your content and where can they yeah. find you on social media? Gosh, at Deuce and Mo. DeuceandMo.com works too. Mm-hmm. They have links to all of our social media accounts. I think I'm more, I've noticed as time goes on, I'm less engaging on Twitter slash X and I'm more engaging with the community or YouTube. And I think that's been really fun to do. So yeah, definitely check out our YouTube channel. We're dropping content. We're going to be live for the draft, live for free agency, going over all the deals that go down. So it's going to be a lot of fun. And I appreciate you having me. And I appreciate you jumping on the pod too, especially everybody that is from Sacramento or that stays in Sacramento, they definitely know who you are. So I appreciate you jumping on the pod and talking about your experiences, your journey into broadcasting and content creating podcasts and everything like that. Maybe next time we can talk a little bit more about the Stockton Kings. I feel like they don't really get as much love since it's a little bit of a 45, 50 minute drive, you know, to Stockton. Not a lot of people always be making that trek over to Stockton. So definitely want to maybe chat with you more about uh, the Stockton Kings maybe next time. Yeah. Sounds good, man.